Hey guys, it's me, Mr. 250, and welcome back to Banshee's Last Cry. So, last episode, as you can see, was successful. It, uh, if you noticed any weird audio lag with my voice in the game, um, I'm trying to see if I can fix that with this video. I was able to fix it just by editing, but I'm hoping to see if I can actually fix it so I don't have to edit quite as much. But anyway, let's get started. At that very moment, the phone started to ring. Good evening, Snowflake Inn, Mr. Forrest said, picking up the phone. Grace and I walked over and sat on the sofa to give him some privacy, but his loud voice carried across the room. Oh, Mr. Fabers, I'm sorry to say that dinner is already finished, but we've saved your room for you. Yes? All right. Right by the station? Well, in that case, I'd say at least 30 or 40 minutes considering how bad the storm's gotten. Sounds like someone else is on their way here. He must have gotten delayed by the snowstorm, whispered Grace. Yeah, probably. I just hope he doesn't get stranded on the way out here. Okay, great. We'll be expecting you, alright? Drive safely. Oh, and our, our good Texan friend is back. Just after Mr. Forrest finished his phone call, the short, middle-aged Texan from earlier came down the stairs. Y'all mind if I turn on the TV? He asked as he approached, his drawl hanging out like his spare tire. <laughs> That's funny. Sure, go right ahead, I said. He plucked the remote off the table and turned on the TV, rapidly flipping through the lame-brained reality series and melodramatic crime shows. Aw, oh, dang it, ain't a darn channel showing it. He switched off the TV and turned back towards me. Say, boy, I don't reckon you heard the closing price, did you? The closing price? Uh, what's company? The stock exchange may as well have been on Mars for all I knew about investing, but even I knew what a closing price was. Not for a company, son. I mean the whole enchilada. The Dow Jones, you see. I can't get any phone reception up here, and I got no way to check the web, neither. Chase, you promise not to work during your stay, eh? Said Mr. Forrest. Ah, Billy boy, this here ain't work. I check the composite every day. Don't feel like the day's done if I don't. Weren't you the one who told me I needed to stop working so hard and take the missus out for a nice date once in a spell? I'm pretty sure Mr. Forrest, noticing that they were watching, stopped midway. Oh, let me introduce you all. This young lady is my niece, Grace. Okay, sorry about that. I accidentally loaded the save from my first playthrough where I called myself Mr. 250. Which, uh, I ended up trashing, but I forgot to change the save. Oh, let me introduce you all. This young lady is my niece, Grace. And this is the man who might just be my nephew-in-law someday, Max. His what? Come on, Uncle Bill. Don't you think you're moving a little fast? No, no, keep it up, Uncle. <laughs> your niece, you say? Well now, ain't she a pretty little filly? Mr. Buchanan leered at Grace as he said it, his, eyes his eyeballs glinting predatorily. Or perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. Mr. Buchanan saved my skin plenty of times back when he was still working at the firm. He runs his own outfit in Dallas. Howdy! Nice to meet you. I gotta tell you, Billy Boy, y'all got a good thing going here. I know tons of folks who would quit their day jobs and wound up practically ruining their whole lives over it, but you're the first one I've known that turned out alright. The short little man from Texas turned to look at me. Y'all could learn a lot from Billy here. He's a great man. By the way, y'all students? Uh, no. I'm pretty much working. That rat. Full-time, salaried employee? Uh, well, no, more on a part-time basis at this point. Well, in that case, come on and work for me. You'll just love it. We work purely on the merit system. None of that seniority bull hunky. We got young folk in their first year making more than old time has been around for ten. His booming voice ensured everyone in the room, and possibly the time zone, could hear him. <laughs> I, I, I really do like this translation. It's really nice. Yeah, but, way I see it, you got a horse what can't pull a plow. It's time to hitch up another one. So how about it? What you say come work for me? 
The idea of spending eight or so hours a day with this man as my boss made me a tad nervous. <laughs> Yeehaw! Let, let, let's save the yeehaw for another time, how about that? Well, I kind of like the job I have now, I said, opting for a safe, non-committal reply. But it didn't appear that Mr. Buchanan was in listening mode. Everybody keeps talking about recession this and recession that. But let me tell you something. America is still the land of opportunity. And anyone willing to work hard can still strike it rich. So what do you say, son? Now, both Mr. Force and Grace were looking at me with amused smiles on their faces. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'll give it some thought, I said trying to put an end to the conversation. I bet you want to know what makes my company so strong, huh? Well, it's all about the business model. I had apparently failed. Sugar Pa, can't you see you're boring him half to death? Said a soft, sweet voice with just a whiff of Southern Belle. I turned around and saw Miss Buchanan... Yeah, Miss Buchanan standing there looking quite beautiful. My husband isn't bothering you, is he? When I saw them earlier from a distance, I thought they were a mismatch of a couple, but now, seeing her up close, she looked even younger than I thought. If he was 35 or 36, Mr. Buchanan, if she was 35 or 36, Mr. Buchanan had to be at least a dozen years older than her. And that was being conservative. Let me introduce y'all to my lovely wife, Amber. And this here is Billy's niece, Grace, and her fiancé, Max. Our impending marriage was steadily becoming a fiat accompli, one that Grace could no, one that Grace no longer even had the energy to refute. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Uh, same here. Smiling brightly, Amber took a seat on the sofa next to Mr. Buchanan. You know, that dinner was a sheer delight from start to finish. Oh, well, I hope you're not just flattering me, Mr. Forrest said, his face rapidly flushed with pride. Absolutely not. It was truly delicious, sir. A compliment from a beautiful woman like you is a real thrill indeed. Was it my imagination, or was there suddenly something in the air? I'm feeling mighty thirsty. Wonder if I could trouble you for a beer or something? Mr. Buchanan, perhaps not liking the situa the sudden camaraderie between the two interjected. Of course. Would you like a drink as well? Asked Mr. Force, trying to smooth things over. Well, maybe just a little, Grace said, holding her fingers a couple inches apart. Just a little for me too, I said, following her lead. Mr. Forrest disappeared into the kitchen at the back of the dining room. Suddenly, the sound of, of something heavy hitting the ground came from outside the window. Whoa, what just fell out there? I blurted out involuntarily. Grace chuckled. It's just the snow falling off the roof. Huh? Oh. That was anticlimactic. <laughs> was it really just snow? As I was looking out the window wondering, I noticed a faint light approaching from far away. Headlights. A few seconds later, the headlights had grown large and I could make out the sound of a car engine. Since there weren't any houses nearby, I assumed it must be a late arriving guest. My suspicion was confirmed when the car went around to the back of the inn, disappearing from sight and abruptly shut off. Sorry I'm late. This is Fabers. Is anyone home? Boomed a deep voice. Ah, Mr. Fabers, I'm so glad you made it. Mr. Forrest came bustling in from the kitchen. He hurriedly placed a few bottles of beer on the table before dashing down to the front desk. Well, it was touch and go for a while there. The wipers were no help at all. I even got stuck in the snow once. Mr. Forrest and the man called Fabers continued to talk as they came up the stairs. Huge and bearded like some man of a, some kind of mountain man from the last century, his appearance was completely at odds with his wealthy sounding name. Dinner's already finished, but I could make a sandwich for you. Are you hungry? asked Mr. Forrest. Hmm. No thanks. I had a bunch to eat on the way, so I'm not hungry at all. But if you have something to drink, I'd sure appreciate it. Sure thing. Coffee? Tea? Hot cocoa? Or maybe some nice warm soup instead? Hot chocolate, then, if it's not too much trouble. Of course. Should I bring it to your room, or would you like to have it here in the lounge? Oh, here would be just great. Fabers glanced briefly in our direction and nodded. All right, here's your key. Why don't you come back after you put your things away? 
Favre took the key, lifted up his luggage, and headed to his room. The cuckoo clock sounded once. It was 8.30 p.m. Oh, sorry if you were waiting. Go ahead and serve yourself. Mr. Forrest disappeared once again into the dining room. Alright then. Y'all don't have to wait. Y'all don't, y'all don't have to twist my arm. Let's wet our beaks. Mr. Buchanan, Grace, and I each took a glass. Cheers. I raised my glass and, glass and put my lips to the rim. Mr. Buchanan, Amber that is, or Miss Buchanan, Amber that is, didn't join us. Either she wasn't a fan of alcohol or she just preferred not to drink that night. Whoa boy, I gotta tell you, sitting in a cozy room, drinking an ice cold beer while the snow is coming down outside, it don't get any better than this, don't you think? Mr. Buchanan had a big grin on his face. Sure. <laughs> I totally agree, I said politely. He wasn't kidding. The pleasure of a cold beer in a warm room while staring at the falling snow out the window was something very different from having one in a hot summer day. Hi everyone. Hope you don't mind if I come join you. Fabrice came into the room, his loud footsteps matching his loud voice. Whoa, you're all drinking beer? Man, you know, you're looking at a guy that almost froze to death out there. With a friendly but hearty sounding laugh, he sat down next to Grace. Ah, Mr. Faberge, that didn't take you long. We're just pouring your hot cocoa now, said Mr. Forrest, bringing another bottle of beer to the table. A moment later, his wife entered with their employee, Abby, who was carrying a mug on a tray. I see you're not drinking beer, Amber. Would you like some hot chocolate, perhaps? I also have some... Mississippi mud cake that I found particularly delicious, if I do say so myself, said Colleen. Amber thought for a moment and then nodded. Thank you, Colleen. I would love that. Ah, I feel like a, like a new man. Fabers blew on a steaming cup of cocoa and sipped it contently. They say it's hard to tell the age of someone with a beard, and that was certainly the case with Mr. Fabers. His voice and manner of speech did make him sound like he was in his mid-thirties, but if he shaved off his beard, I wouldn't have been surprised to find out that he was closer to me and Grayson age. So, are we the only guests staying here tonight? asked Fabers, looking around the table. No, there are four more of you, answered Mr. Forrest. Oh, right, Abby. Would you please go and ask the three girls if they'd like to join us for some hot cocoa? Sure, Mr. Forrest. Abby hurried towards the kitchen counter. Uh, what about the man staying alone? She, she said, turning in our direction. He makes me a little nervous. She must mean the not mafia guy, I thought. Oh, Mr. Jones. Yes, please ask him too. Uh, really? Uh, are you sure? Well, if you don't want to, that's fine. I didn't really get the impression he's much for socializing anyway. Whew. Abby used the phone at the front desk to phone the three girls. They said they'll be right down, Mr. F. Hanging up the phone, she turned and shouted in our direction. Abby really needs to work on her manners a bit more, Mr. Four said with an embarrassed smile. All right, I'll just go and get three more cups ready then. Colleen picked up the tray and disappeared back into the kitchen. Man, you can't beat the service here, Faber said, shaking his head. Well, making people happy is the whole reason I opened this inn. Mr. Forrest looked embarrassed, but pleased with the compliment. A minute later, the three girls came in together. Oh, hi everybody. Quit pushing, Tiffany. I was right in the middle of my favorite show. In no time, the quiet of the lounge was shattered. Mmm, that smells great. Oh, sorry, can I squeeze by here? I told you to quit pushing, Tiffany. With all the extra people, Grace and I decided to sit at the table. Even so, the sofas were still packed tight. Just then, Colleen returned with the cocoa. I asked Bobby if he wanted to come, but he was watching TV and said he didn't want anything. Thanks for the cocoa. Together, the three girls raised their mugs to the mouth and blew softly before taking a sip. The cuckoo clock rang out. Everyone looked towards it. It was already nine o'clock. When the clock stopped telling the hour, the roaring wind outside began to sound louder than it had before. The frames in the windows rattled violently, threatening to break the thick double-pane glass. There... Won't be an avalanche, will there? 
asked Molly nervously. Oh God, cut it out, Molly. We don't need any more bad luck. I'm still freaked out about what happened earlier. Tiffany blushed and covered her mouth with her hands. Happened earlier? Asked Faberge. I tried my best to cover for Tiffany. They were talking about us getting snowed in and starving to death. They found a cockroach in their soup. Ugh. Or they found a threatening note saying that someone would die tonight. I mean, honestly, honesty is the best policy, right? <laughs> oh, 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 I see we're supposed to cover. Whoops, that was a bad one. Oh, well. They found a threatening note saying that someone would die tonight. <laughs> yeah, that little that little sound. You'll hear it a couple more times in the game, but that's whenever we make a... Maybe a June pay decision, let's just say that, where we make it just a kind of odd, off-the-wall decision. Ah, oh, crap. That was exactly what happened, wasn't it? Fortunately, I don't think it registered with anyone, because there was no reaction. I really need to work on my inner filter. Um, do you work here at the inn? Tiffany asked Fobberge. Me? No, I'm just staying here for the night. But here, let me introduce myself properly to you guys. After all, there are lots of beautiful young ladies here tonight. He put down his mug, and his voice suddenly sounded more formal. My name is Jonas Fobberge, but you can just call me Fobberge. I'm a freelance photographer. I do, I mostly do outdoor landscapes, but if you're interested, I also do some very tasteful nude photography. I wasn't sure if that was a joke or not, but he laughed to himself anyway. Nude? Oh, no way! The girls giggled excitedly. Oh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. At your age, your skin's still remarkably supple and firm. But in a few years, after gravity starts to play havoc with you, you look back and wish you had some photos that captured all of that youthful beauty. I looked at Grace to see her reaction. She didn't seem to be offended, which was a relief. Hey, you should give it a try, Debbie said, nudging Tiffany with her knee. Oh, no way, I'm way too shy to, like, bare my body like that, Tiffany protested. She wasn't all that convincing. What the heck was that? It sounded like glass broke somewhere, Mr. Buchanan exclaimed. I'll go take a look. Mr. Forrest got up quickly from the seat and headed down the hallway. The light mood in the room suddenly turned dark. After a bit, the forest returned along with Bobby. Mr. Forrest, sorry. Everything looks normal on the first floor. Would you all mind going and checking your own rooms, please? If one of the windows is broken, it'll be freezing in here in no time at all. None of us was interested in sleeping in a freezing cold room, so we all got up and headed to our individual rooms. As soon as I got to my room, I opened the door and took a quick peek, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Just to be sure, I made certain the window was firmly shut before heading back out of the hallway. Grace, Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan, and Fabers each checked their own rooms. It didn't take a mind reader to tell from the looks on their faces that their rooms were normal as well. After examining the empty room, Mr. Forrest joined us in the hallway. Nothing in any of your rooms, eh? which means that there's just one left to check out. Mr. Forrest stared at the last remaining door. Of course it had to do belong to that one mob-looking guy. Unconsciously, we had all arranged ourselves so that we were surrounding Mr. Forrest. Now that I think about it, maybe he was the one who wrote that note, Grace blurted out. What do you mean? Maybe he killed someone in there, she said softly, so only I could hear. Come on, Grace. Besides, it's only nine o'clock, right? Even if that were really a murder note, it said midnight. Yeah, but criminals usually only write stuff like that to confuse people. Didn't you ever read uh, the, uh, Agatha Christie? Good point. Mr. Jones, are you in there? Summoning his resolve, Mr. Forrest marched up to the door and knocked forcefully. He waited for a few seconds, to no effect. I listened closely and could make out the sound of rushing wind from inside the room. Mr. Jones! He knocked again, harder this time. Again, there was no response. Sounds like something happened in there, I said. Mr. Forrest nodded and placed his hand on the doorknob. It's locked. With a nervous sigh, he inserted the key he was holding into the keyhole. There was a clicking sound as the lock disengaged. Mr. Jones? He started to open the door. 
but as soon as it opened, we all knew something was terribly wrong. We were assaulted by a powerful blast of freezing cold air from inside the room. Beyond this gust came the sound of rapidly flapping curtains, along with something banging loudly. Mr. Jones! The force of the wind ripped the door from Mr. Forrest's hand and slammed it violently against the wall. I got my first look at the room. It had twin beds, just like mine. The inn had no single, so even people staying alone had dual beds. A frenzy of snow was blasting into the room from the shattered window. The heavy curtain on the window was flapping so hard that it threatened to rip itself off the curtain rod. Shards of glass and snow littered the bed near the window, but there was no one to be seen. Are you in there? Mr. Jones! Calling out in a loud voice, Mr. Forrest opened the bathroom door right next to the entrance. We had heard a sound from the window. Turning, we saw that the window, reduced mostly to its frame, was hanging, was banging against the outside wall. Do you think he jumped out? I asked. Why would he do that? countered Mr. Forrest. I had no answer, of course. Meanwhile, he seemed to be hesitating. Aren't you going to take a look? Mr. Forrest nodded and slowly started forward, deeper into the room. Griggs and I followed him while the others remained outside in the hallway. Using his right hand to shield his face from the blowing snow, Mr. Forrest arrived at the broken window. He stopped and froze, abruptly appearing stricken. Oh God, he muttered. I inched forward until I saw that what he was staring at. There was a gap of about a foot and a half between the bed and the window. Lying there on the floor was what looked like a collection of mannequin parts. A hand was sticking out from beneath a black cloth. Atop that lay a brown colored foot that looked like it had been carelessly tossed there. A pair of sunglasses near a face that was splattered with something dark and red. You know those dolls where the arms and the legs are connected in the torso by a red string? And if you loosen the string, the whole body just comes apart? Well that's what this looked like. A collection of body parts just stacked on top of one another. Oh god, it's a body! Mr. Forrest shouted suddenly, unaware of the freezing wind and snow pouring onto him from the broken window. Unable to utter a sound, Grace and I just stood there and stared at the horrifying pile that was already disappearing under a layer of snow. Ten minutes later, the guests and the staff of the Snowflake Inn were all gathered in the lounge. Well, everyone except for that guy that was now cut up in pieces, that is. So there you go. That's the first look into the uh, what we're going to be dealing with. It's a uh, murder mystery, to be sure. And it's... Uh, it gets better. It really does. It's it's it, it is a really fun story. But uh, we're gonna leave it there for today. I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. It's uh it's definitely a bit of work to record on the iPhone, but as you can tell, it's definitely doable. So let me know what you guys think, and if you're really interested, we will go through the whole game. If there's not a ton of interest, I may just you know just do one route, just like one path through the game but if people are interested please let me know and uh, we could probably do a full game because that would be fun anyway thanks for watching and i'll see you guys next time bye